Welcome to One Broken Mom, a podcast dedicated to raising awareness of mental health, parenting, and self-improvement. I am the host, Ami Quiricone. One Broken Mom is not a family show. It is meant for adults and contains sometimes adult language. The topics I cover can be serious and unsettling to people. However, I do have a sense of humor laced with a little bit of a punk rock attitude. So if you're interested in real talks about real stuff by real people so that we can all get better together, well, then you're in the right place. And so welcome. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Broken Mom. Um, I'm particularly excited about today's episode for several reasons. First of all, if any of you have actually listened to my season two intro monologue I did, you'll have heard and remember that I shared a particular moment in my life experiences that stood out and actually had lifelong consequences because it would be determined about 40 years later in therapy that that experience and the lack of caregiving and the follow-up from it actually created PTSD for me. Now, this episode is also pretty awesome because the week before the season two launched, I got an email from a listener who says, quote, can you please interview Anna Runkle? Her crappy childhood fairy course changed my life. Now, at the end of every episode, I invite everyone to head over to amiquircone.com, shoot me a message so that I can hear what you think, and to let me know, like this listener did, if there's a topic or question that you'd like to learn more about as it relates to mental health parenting and self-improvement. And so, since I suppose most of you probably at this point hit the stop button once you hear the music coming in on the, uh, the start of the end, I'm going to remind you that I really do mean it, and that's what this episode is about today. And if I might digress for a moment, um, I also want to remind you that while you're listening to Apple Podcasts in the show, you can easily leave a review or rate the show, which makes it easier for other listeners to decide if One Broken Mom is worth their time to listen. And so I believe for at least dozens of you out there um, that you do think so, and so I would totally appreciate it. So now, back to this. I want to say thank you to Lydia in California, um, because after she sent me her email, I did check out the website Crappy Childhood Fairy, and I saw, holy shit, that this person is helping people specifically with childhood PTSD. So then I thought to myself, well, here was the universe at work again. Um, So I sent her a, a message to Anna, and she said yes. And so thank you, Anna, and welcome to One Broken Mom today. Thank you, Ami. It's so nice to meet you. I was really delighted to discover your work as well. Oh, cool. Well, um, I like uh, like-minded people, right? And so after I read through your bio and saw, you know, your kind of uh, entry into this world and this realm came at that very honest and organic way and then doing something very similar, which is what can I do to help other people through this? I'm, I'm totally drawn and, and attracted to that. So um, I'm, I'm so happy to be able to share this episode with you and, and be able to introduce other people to what it is that you're doing um, in this topic. Now, I, I want to end the suspense right away and ask you, what's up with the name Crappy Childhood Fairy? <laughs> I, you know, every time I hear it, it makes me laugh. And, you know, that's like a really good business name, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I had been thinking for a long time as I was trying to conceive of this thing that I was trying to make. I thought it would be a book and then it was a blog and now it's a YouTube channel and it's a bunch of courses. And when I was first trying to figure it out, I had these very serious names in mind, like your healing year or, and I just kept thinking, you know, I would never (laughs) want to go, like, who would want to go do that? It's so, it's just such a drag to have PTSD already. Like, where's the fun? So it started as a blog with cartoons and the crappy childhood fairy. I remember I walked out and told my teenage kids, you know, I have this idea and it's crappy childhood fairy. And they were like, no, we'd be so embarrassed if you said that. And I was like, good, then that's going to be my name. Yes. And I just, I, I, it kind of explains what it is and it doesn't oversell it. I'm not a therapist or a doctor, you know? <laughs> and it's about as straightforward as it gets and it does crack people up. Yeah, it does. It certainly does. And I like how you, you, you kind of ca- you know, categorize this, like, where's the fun in this? Because, right, after having dealt with your life of just the junk that comes as a result of not understanding what's going on inside your head, you're kind of like, yeah, let's, uh, let's find an upside here and let's like, like start this journey up out of this hole and, and go somewhere positive. So um, I appreciate that. Now, I've actually written about PTSD before on my blog, and this happened before I was actually doing my podcasting. Um, because as I, you know, had just mentioned earlier, you know, the experience that I had, and it's one of many, but the one kind of pivotal first experience that kind of shaped every, you know, thing after that, um, it, when my therapist looked at me and said, looks like you've been dealing with PTSD. Of course, I left the therapy session and totally dove into understanding and researching it. Cause it's like, I, I'm like most people at that time. It's like PTSD is this thing that afflicts 
veterans, first responders, victims of violence, um, and that understanding or, or seeing that something could happen in childhood that's nowhere near that um, intense, let's say, could actually um, have a similar impact to, to a child. So what kinds of events can be viewed as traumatic for children that adults might not see that way that could turn into PTSD? Yeah, well, so it was in the 1980s that PTSD kind of entered the common consciousness as this veteran combat thing. Uh, and usually what PTSD means is there was perhaps a single event. It usually happened in adulthood. And soon what we began to distinguish was something called chronic PTSD or CPTSD, which means it happened from a bunch of stuff happening over time. And that's more what kids are going to tend to have. And it could come from, now these are, to answer your question, like how do you identify what are the stressors? There's a very common index out there. It's called the ACE Survey Adverse Childhood Experiences. And it lists 10 common things, including sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect. You saw your mom beat up. You had a parent who was incarcerated. And you, there's going to be links to that later at the end of the podcast, you can take the quiz yourself. There's 10 things. There's a lot of things that they, when they created that 20 years ago, they forgot to mention, like growing up in a war, uh, living in a dangerous neighborhood. There's a lot of things you could add to that list. But they're chronic, that's the thing. Or a parent with a mental illness. And now a parent with mental illness, that's like a category that could be like, well, maybe your mom had a period of depression for a couple months. Or it could be you had a parent who had full-on schizophrenia and couldn't care for you. So they're, you know, just these labels don't totally mean a lot. And the thing is, everybody's different. So, you know, I might be exposed to a stressor and get completely PTSD'd about it. You might not. So people are different. And it seems like there's a genetic predisposition to develop PTSD. Not everybody does. You could have siblings in the same family where some of them really show the signs and others just get resilient. Resilience is also a factor in whether people develop it, and uh, people have tried to create resilience surveys, and that has to do with, did you have supportive adults in your life? Did you feel like you were a good student? Did you get rewarded for that? Did you have close friends who loved you? Did you have people you could confide in? And those kind of things can also mitigate the impact of the stressors that you might have been growing up with. But here's the thing. When you're young, your brain is developing. And so a very intense chronic stress actually causes brain changes. And one of the most acute examples is for babies. And when a baby is in its first few months and in you know, its first few years, it's, it's, these first few years are very important, but especially in the first few months, there's a lot of brain development still going on right after birth. And so if caregivers, usually the mother, if they are not able to connect with that baby and look at it, respond and mirror back the facial expressions and the sounds that the baby makes, there are brain changes that take place as a result. And so this to me was the earth shattering thing. When you find out that what's been going on with you just might be chronic CP, you know, CPTSD, then you find out, wait, it's a brain injury and therefore it's really, really not your fault. Mm -hmm. Now, I get into my whole courses and my website deal a lot with um, the part that's the brain injury that's not your fault, but then it causes this brain dysregulation. And we can talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. A person who has a dysregulated brain ends up doing a lot of stuff to try to get a hold of that re-regulated brain. And some of the things are not very good coping mechanisms. Smoking is very popular. Smoking is a, you know, kind of a clumsy attempt to re-regulate. I was a big smoker. Um, uh, raging, overeating, any kind of drug or alcohol use, you know, it, that's a lot for some people, those things can temporarily be re-regulating and so they're very comforting. So it's so natural that people would turn to these kind of self-defeating behaviors when they're dealing with dysregulation. So really what the breakthrough has been now is like, to understand we had brain changes they explain a lot about how we seem to make the same crazy mistakes over and over again why we can be so overreactive and that if we can learn to re-regulate our brains suddenly that there's a level playing field again that we can recover just like anybody else mm -hmm. so that's kind of in a nutshell 
Yeah, I know um, when I had also, you know, was exploring the topic, um, the, the DSM actually had been updated recently to include childhood uh, PTSD in there specifically and, and, lie, and outlying it because I do know some of the listeners um, have, uh, and this is what happened with me, is I go back in time and I think of, you know, a memory and it's the one that I shared in my season two opener of um, my mother walking out and just being terrified because at six years old, that was like, she died. She died. She abandoned me. I'm going to die, you know, and not getting any any emotional support, you know, after that. And, um, but then there are, you know, and so that's the one where people are like that is that a traumatic event? Well, it, it turned out it was, you know, because it started and stirred up nightmares in me, ongoing nightmares. And this tuned into this environment in a way that made me very hypersensitive about certain things in certain situations. And, um, but then other people do actually have genuinely traumatic events like the death of a parent um, or, you know, some other experience in there. And um, I know I've seen on your site too, that we, we carry the common kind of idea that trauma sometimes feels like a really tough word to use because it, it implies big things all the time and in childhood. And I've talked about this many times on the show with many guests, you know, there's this understanding of like, we don't have a really good word yet to kind of replace it. Somebody the other day when I was reading called it child maltreatment. Okay. That's closer, I guess, you know, to, to what a neglect can do and stuff. Um, but you know, trauma at a child's eyes is not the same as the trauma at the adult's eyes. And, you know, and so looking at, um, you know, that there's a bevy of little experiences that we can run into that are um, not what an adult is going to look at and say, I don't really need to follow up with my kid. They're, they're fine because it didn't affect me. It's not scary to me or anything. Um, now, you actually, um, I want to fast forward to adults and not get into, you know, diagnosing PTSD in children because you work with the adults like the after effects. So you're adults, you had this traumatic experience. You didn't get any treatment for it. Nobody knew what was going on at that point in time. So this isn't blame against parents or caregivers around you for not recognizing it. I mean, this is a, a recent development here. Um, and so what are the signs today of uh, an adult that should start to sit there and go, am I actually responding from an unhealed significant trauma, you know, PTSD style trauma um, that's manifesting today? And you hit on a couple of the symptoms, but what are some of the other signs uh, that are pretty strong indications that that's what's going on for somebody? Sure. I can talk about that. I just, you know, I was so struck that you felt like your mother walking out wasn't a legitimate trauma. Oh, I was, <laughs> I will, I will clarify that um, when it, kind of the light went off for me, like you had that moment of like, holy shit, right? So my mm -hmm. holy shit moment was um, when I realized, uh, you know, because I could remember that moment every day, anytime I wanted to. And every time I did, I cried. Every time I did, 40 some years later, remembering that moment made me cry. And then when I recognized that that was the root right there and was able to go through the work and the healing and the therapy to heal it, it, it doesn't do that to me anymore. And so, you know, I had said that like, I know we dismiss trauma, right, a lot, but I start telling people, but if you're looking at me and you're telling me a story of your childhood and I can see the tears, swell, you know, kind of welling up in your eyes, that deserves a little bit more attention and probably not to dismiss it as much as you think. So I do have to throw that out yeah, there. Like, yeah. yeah, like it was like, it's no big deal, but I'm 40 years old crying about it. So, you know, clearly I've got it under control, you know? Well, I'll tell you, you know, Sometimes what's been happening until recently is that trauma has been looked at, like everybody recognized that certain bad things were clearly bad, but a lot of other things were dismissed. But that's because people who are basically like neurotypical, you know, they don't have PTSD, they didn't have significant trauma. They're looking at this and they're thinking, well, how would I feel if my mom left? And they're able to project what the psychological feeling would be, the emotion. But what's been invisible to everybody is that actually your physiology changes. If you're a six-year-old girl and you lose your mom, your physiology changes. Your endocrine system changes. Your, your nervous system changes. There's so many things that just haven't been clearly understood or measured yet. But there are whole pieces of development that aren't going to happen the way that they were meant to happen without that. And so the trauma isn't just psychological. And that was, for me, that was one of the most liberating things because I've been hearing, you know, I was somebody, I made a lot of, I did a lot of crazy behaviors that are clearly trauma behaviors. I was really drawn to unavailable and destructive partners, for example, again and again, like everything else going well in my life, but I would keep doing that. And people would go, I guess, you know, they just couldn't understand it. They'd be like, 
why don't you just go for nice guys? And I'd be like, I know, like, I think I'm doing that, but it just keeps not being that. And they'd be like, maybe you're just trying to recreate your childhood. And I would think, I, I felt like I had to say yes to that, but it never felt true. Of course, I'm not trying to recreate my childhood, anything, but I'm trying to have like a great relationship and a great life. And I'm confounded why it just keeps going badly. That's what it's like to have trauma. There's, there's a part of my brain that's not conscious, that's doing stuff that undermines things. And now what's emerging in the past 10 years or so is the science that explains that. And it's just been such a relief, like, okay, I'm not crazy. I'm not psychologically ass backwards here, like trying to make something bad in my life. I'm trying to make something good. But we know, so it, when I talk about signs today, some of them are kind of strange. Some of them are what you might expect and some are not. But here's, here's what we know. When people had a lot of traumatic events um, happen, they, you know, there's this index that was created by Kaiser Permanente in conjunction with the Centers for Disease Control over 20 years ago. They've been using this as a crude measurement of how, what did you go through. And the more, you, the more adverse childhood experiences a person has experienced, the, the higher the probability that they're gonna have these terrible things. Some of the stuff is what you'd expect. Depression, addiction, uh, stress. But here's some things. Did you know it's, you're more likely to be obese, to have diabetes, to have heart disease, to have COPD, <laughs> to have high blood pressure, mm -hmm. to have unintended pregnancies, to have abortions, to have, uh, um, you know, the, uh, like everything, uh, everything bad just about is linked with trauma. <laughs> everything that people could experience that's painful or rough is linked with trauma. And some of the stuff that hasn't been measured well yet, but that I notice is, you know, just having really crappy relationships, romantic relationships. And when that doesn't go well, you know, it kind of spreads out through your whole life and through the generations. Mm -hmm. And like we know, when we talk about poverty or inequality, the single biggest driver of what's going to cause people to be poor, what is it? Education? No. Socioeconomic status? No. It's, it's, it's whether there's two parents raising the kids. That's the single biggest driver of whether you're going to be poor or not. And if so, if you can't put together a good relationship, and many of us have kids anyway, I had kids as a single mom originally. I spent nine years as a single mom. Now I'm married. I'm sort of retroactively piecing together, you know, the things I would have wanted earlier. And sure enough, it goes better. <laughs> <laughs> I just could not, and people would go, oh, you're putting, you're putting your, career first it's like no i'm not i can't i can't have a relationship with a decent person to save my life you know that's kind of where i was during my whole fertile years you know i just kept twice i ended up with drug addicts you know without realizing it one was sober when we got together for several years and then he relapsed then he overdosed and died oh gosh that's years crazy. later somebody i thought he was okay he wasn't okay he was secretly smoking heroin i had no idea i had this huge blind spot Mm -hmm. I knew something wasn't right, but, you know, I totally distrusted my instincts and, um, and he ended up committing suicide. Oh so this gosh. is no joke. Having no. PTSD like has hurt my judgment so badly. So I had to learn a better way to live. Um, but I also, before I talk about like the solution that, that I've kind of worked out through all of this, I'll tell you what the symptom, common symptoms are. It comes in waves. It comes, as, it comes in the form of dysregulation, and dysregulation is a neurological phenomenon. It can also refer to emotional dysregulation, which is sort of a whole thing psychologically where somebody gets very upset irrationally, um, can't bring their emotions back down. You know, we've all been there sometimes, but some people have it harder than others. But neurological dysregulation can trigger everything from that emotional overreaction to autoimmune diseases to um, an inability to learn or pay attention. Uh, um, I've heard from the experts that uh, so much ADHD is probably misdiagnosed complex PTSD. Yep. And who knows where the line is? Like all of these things may become meaningless one day as we understand better what's going on. But dysregulation makes it very hard to pay attention. So I, I reached a crisis point with my own PTSD. I had no idea I had it. This was 25 years ago and I had this very bad couple of months where my mom was dying. And she, my mom was a serious alcoholic, and that's a lot where my kind of PTSD comes from. Is I was raised in an environment that had everything that severe alcoholism causes. We were very poor. There was a lot of violence. There, nobody was taking care of the kids. We were sometimes hungry. Um, there was sexual abuse. Um, just you know, uh, right. 
right. just no, nope, yeah, the whole the thing. The mess, Alcohol, all of it, yeah. <laughs> also known as alcoholism. Right. And <laughs> so, we, <laughs> so we had that. And uh, so I grew up and thought that I had completely transcended it, but I started to have the problems in relationships. And it was actually like getting worse. They say alcoholism is progressive and fatal when it's not treated. Well, mine was progressive and it was seemingly fatal because I was so depressed as, it, as my PTSD got worse and worse that I began to think there was no way that I could keep living. And I began to like think of the alternatives. I was in therapy three times a week. And I'm one of the people where we now know talking about the past and talking about trauma actually triggers me more. Mm -hmm. I can't even process information, let alone like come up with a logical plan of what I'm going to do to improve things. I would just go out of therapy and go sit in my car and cry and cry and cry. And then think about how I could hide from my therapist, how bad it really was. So she didn't get me locked up. It was bad. Mm -hmm. there were other things that like looked okay in my life, but after a while it wasn't looking okay. And I was, I was full of rage. Um, I was very inconsiderate of other people. And you see this a lot in PTSD that's extreme, but most of us are living on a much more subtle level. And I'll tell you what it looks like when it's subtle. I feel numb. I can't feel my nose. My hands feel kind of clumsy. I trip on my own feet. I can't remember where I put my keys. I want to go out of the house but just getting together my purse, my keys, and remembering my phone so I know where to go, all of that can be like this vicious circle that I can't really even get out of. So this, this is, those are the subtle signs. Well, all of, it, all of it got very bad for me 25 years ago when I, my mom was dying. I went on a first date with a guy who I kind of liked. It had been a long time since I had been on a date with somebody I liked. And I was very hopeful. And out of the blue, these people came out and attacked us unconscious. They beat us, you know, kicked us in the head and face till we were unconscious. And we survived. And I got x-rays afterwards and CT scans. And they said, well, you have a broken jaw and broken teeth, but basically your brain's okay. We're not seeing bleeding. So you're fine. Go home. But I wasn't fine. Oh, yeah. And... Then the guy, a week later, the guy broke up with me and then my mom died. And I just went into this like full PTSD, bad place. Yeah, a tailspin right there. A tailspin and I couldn't yeah. get out. And it was so severe, I couldn't read a paragraph. I couldn't like look at a phone number that was written on a piece of paper and push the numbers. I couldn't do it. And but that's how short my attention span was. I would just get flummoxed trying to make a phone call. And I kept going to the doctor and they said, you're fine. I go to the therapist and she'd say, let's talk about it. And I was going down. And so this woman came along. She um, was somebody I kind of knew through a theater thing that I was in. She was much younger than me. She was covered with tattoos. She said fuck all the time. And she talked about God. And she was, she was sober in AA. I never met anybody like her. And, and I just was absolutely captivated. Like, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? And I, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. People who talk about God, you know, in my life then, I just used to think they were like stupid or rednecks or something I just didn't I didn't I wasn't raised that way she was amazing and I could see in her eyes she had some sort of like clarity and I wanted that and she, she said are you an alcoholic and unfortunately no that's I, I don't have a thing with alcohol I you know I almost wished I did at the time it's just like I just want to have whatever you have I need that I'm dying here right and she said well do you want to try to do what I do what I did to get sober anyway and I was like yeah I'll do everything and so she showed me the techniques that I've ended up like trying to share with people with PTSD. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time to understand that what she showed me as sort of a 12 step thing was also healing my brain. And mm -hmm. not everybody in 12 step stuff is doing what she showed me, but she showed me how to write every day, my fears and resentments and follow it with meditation. And it sounds so simple that it couldn't possibly work, but it like within two weeks, I was like, I totally had my wits about me more than I'd ever had them before. My depression went down. I still had a, just a, like a life full of problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was going to take a long time to work any of that out. And of course, it's always a work in progress. But, uh, but that when, now that I work with a lot of people who have what I have, um, what they relate to that I have is um, a feeling of really like they just get completely broadsided to find out they're with people who are unreliable or um, unsafe or not available. Um, a big difficulty paying attention, um, a tendency to overreact in emotional situations, especially around certain triggers like abandonment, and then 
sometimes after a really intense reaction, a deadness. There's this kind of like, and then, and then a, like a flatlining of emotions. And, it, and the rage can really push people away, but also that flatness, that deadness afterwards can push people away where we seem not to care at all. It's very, very hard for people to love us like that. Mm -hmm. So I have really happy news. There's actually, you can heal from this. And the, oh. the, the key is that, it's, that you start with the brain injury. Yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, I, I, I share this when I'm listening uh, and with all the, the folks that I talk to and stuff like that, because um, I want the listeners to understand what my experience is a little bit as I'm doing this, because um, uh, while you're talking about certain things, this is how deep it can be. Um, and, and it takes time. Patience is also one of those things that you have to be patient with yourself. It took a long time to build up the, the shit you need to get rid of. <laughs> and so don't expect it to go away instantly. And so even though, you know, I feel like as a person, I'm, I'm dedicated. I talk to, to experts at least two to three times a week. I'm meeting a new person who's put filling in pieces for me and I'm doing it through the show. But when you say a word like abandonment or you say something, you talk about the relationships of the people that are bad for you, especially from the personal relationships um, and, you know, and talk about how some things seem like they're going well, but yet you're still self-sabotaging. I mean, I'm sitting there resonating and I've said this before and people will listen to the show. will hear me say that my chest tightens. I mean, it's a, it's a physical response that even though I know and I heal and I'm working on it, the, it's such a deep part of the, you know, of our neurosystem and of our bi biology when it gets written into it at that young age that um, it, it just, it's going to take time for me to not hear a word like that and not have it just, and it's less and less, um, but it still, it still comes in there. Like I can feel just like, you know, it's like the, the heart starts to pound just a little bit and, you know, and then it's like, I'm sitting here. And so for people like I'm sitting here regulating myself as I'm listening to an interview, I sound like I got everything together. I, you know, I, you know, I, I don't have a lot of the problems that I did before, but it doesn't change the fact that there's still that instant, you know, kind of like, you know, I don't want to be left. I don't want to be abandoned. I don't want to be left. I don't want to be abandoned, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and like you, uh, hearing you, um, a lot of the same things like happen for me. It's like, you know, everything kind of spins out of control. You're making mistakes over and over again. You don't want any of these mistakes. I remember growing up with an, uh, you know, and my, my biological dad, my um, birth father was an alcoholic, which, you know, again, came with all the, all the alcoholism. And, um, and I remember, you know, being told that alcoholism is, is passed down, you know, like it was a gene. And of course this is, you know, I'm 47 years old. So we're talking 20, 30 years ago where this, you know, this idea that alcoholism was a gene. So I actually feared alcohol. Like I didn't, I didn't drink for, you know, a very long time. You know, even when my peers, you know, even in high school were doing it, I wasn't because it was like, eh, you know, I don't want to go down that path because I don't want to turn into an alcoholic. Um, but now looking back at it, it's like alcoholism is passed down probably in a much more subtle way. Like it's passed down through the trauma that if you grow up with an alcoholic parent, you know, it's likely with an un, un, unresolved situation, you might become an alcoholic because it's a symptom of, you know, your coping and your regulation of that. Um, so you, you've been able to then uh, put together some pieces and thank you so much for sharing a lot of your story there because um, I know that that's what uh, other listeners sometimes need to hear as well. They need to hear that they're not alone, um, that they have their own crappy childhood and it's not unique to them. And I tell people like I have a story. I don't think mine's particularly remarkable and that's why it's important is because there's a lot of people with similar you know, different experiences but you know, ways in which we're all trying to navigate through them. Um, but you talked about daily practices and that's something that you actually have on your website is, is some strategies for starting to kind of gain a little bit of control over this, this power, you know, that's been in the background behind a lot of our heads that have been guiding us. You know, I called it being on a train. I couldn't stop. I could say what I wanted to do. I could, you know, try to do what I wanted to do. But then I felt, you know, about mine was about seven, eight years ago, my first tailspin. And, but yet I, it, I, I was on a train and my, my ex-husband, my kid's dad and I were looking at it going, oh, why is this happening? I, was like, I don't know why it's happening. I have no idea why it's happening. I don't want it to be happening, but yet I don't know how to stop it from happening. Um, and so, uh, you know, but you found by reaching out or, or connecting with this woman in that, in that group, some ways of getting started. So would you mind talking a little bit about these daily practices that you sure. yeah. 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 So she got me started and, um, very quickly I was showing it to other people and now 25 years have passed. And now this is like 20,000 people have checked it out through my stuff. It's, 
It's, <laughs> I'm so excited. It's the only thing I've ever found that helps me. So here's what I know. Some people, um, some people really get helped with PTSD. There's, a, there's two channels that are pretty good for getting in there. One is like somatic therapies that are movement based. Mm -hmm. And um, that can also include things like yoga or going to a dance class with other people or even singing in a choir. There's, it's, it's a sort of a physical re-regulation of your nervous system. And everybody has that component. We also have kind of a language component and what I call the hamster wheel. So a lot of what dysregulation, what's happening is the hamster wheel starts really going with a lot of little thoughts. And I'm not talking about voices in your head or anything, but you know, just fearful, resentful thoughts about stuff. Nobody likes me. I'm really fat. I didn't get enough done today. And uh, also, oh shoot, I forgot to make that phone call. And also the world's coming to an end. And also I hate everybody. And also <laughs> especially rich people. So this, like, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> that's what's going on. And the more that that, the faster that's spinning, the just, just basically <laughs> the harder it's going to be to be useful at all to anyone. And you become that hamster trapped in it that you're just kind of yeah. traveling with it yeah. around the wheel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're not present. And it's, it's ultimately, it's a very self-centered way to be, not to knock anybody, but just having like lived there for so long, I, I could be very like numb to like what other people were saying, how they were feeling. I could, I was like mystified, like, why don't I feel connected to people? And it was basically because I couldn't hear them. I had so much like inner chatter going on. Mm -hmm. So what my friend showed me, she just said, so you, you put down on paper and I, she taught it to me as a spiritual thing that she was an AA person, you know, and I, I ended up going to the 12 step program for families of alcoholics and that's continued to be incredibly helpful to me. But I have adapted this for people who are not in any kind of 12-step recovery. It's for, it's for if you relate to childhood PTSD. You write on paper what your fears and resentments are. So it's, I have fear, and uh, I write whatever it is. It's not an exercise to dig or analyze or try to find grand reasons for anything. It's just like right now, I have fear my water glass is running out, and I'm on a podcast, and I can't go get more water. And <laughs> I'm actually okay, but it's, it can be as trivial as that, you know, and fear nobody likes me and fear I've made a fool of myself and fear I mess everything up and then back to the trivia, you know, fear I'm running out of milk and fear what time is it. So my mind is just kind of skipping around between big grave things and fear I've cancer and fear I need milk and it's just skipping around. I get it on paper and as my friend explained it to me once, she goes, you know how somebody tells you their phone number and you don't have anywhere to write it down and you have to just go, oh, well, this is three, well, this is five, five, one, oh, it's a three. She goes, well, now write it down and then go think about something else. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it is. I just don't have to think. I get, a, I get a break from the hamster wheel for a while. I put it down on paper. I write enough that I feel better. And at the end, I sign off. And um, there's a way that I was shown and uh, I've adapted it for people who are trying to do this in a way without spirituality where they're it's more like a, a conversation with their higher self. But the essence of it is you're willing and ready to just release this fear and resentment. Oh, and resentment, by the way, resentment is huge in there. Sometimes people say they don't have resentment, but they, um, and, and I don't know why everybody says that you're supposed to. It's like, okay, so put down, I'm resentful at the people who say I'm supposed to have resentment. <laughs> But any feeling of, yeah, it's the negative feeling towards people in institutions and things. So I'm resentful. and. And by the way, there's going to be a link. I have a free course on Teachable. Anybody can go sign up right away for it. You'll, you can get that below. The, um, it's very simple. So you write it down. I'm resentful at so-and-so because, and I want to say it's because of what they did, but first I say because it, I have fear what they did. So if Joe punched me in the nose, I say I'm resentful at Joe because I have fear he punched me in the nose. And you go, oh, how could you say that? <laughs> he did punch you in the nose. Your nose is bleeding. And I, there's a number of reasons. First, often ob objective reality is not our forte. <laughs> <laughs> so we leave a little room for that. Also, because the, if it's turned from, you know, if I get punched in the nose and I get angry and I punch back, okay, that's anger. Resentment is when I just cannot stop thinking about how wronged I was and what, what did everybody think about that and what did it mean about me? So then I just get back to writing the fears that I have about that. So at the end, it's, you know, I'm ready now, and uh, I, I, I ask God to remove the fears and resentments. People who don't believe in God can say, I now release these. And then, in my case, I pray for knowledge, 
of God's will for me and the power to carry it out. Somebody who wants to do that in a secular way with their higher self, they can seek the clarity of what their next move is and to have the energy and focus to do it. So there's, you, you can adapt this to, to, to what speaks to you. But the idea is to have less junk on your windshield so that you can see where you're going and go there. Mm -hmm. And that's what freedom is. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people say, well, I don't have time to add this into my day. The writing takes however long it takes, you know, five minutes, 20 minutes. Then I follow it with meditation. And it was suggested to me that I go learn transcendental meditation. I have a little video where I teach people not transcendental meditation. That's like a thing you pay for. And, and, and it's great. And I if you like meditation, I recommend it. But, but I teach them something very simple where you just take a meaningless word like okay or this some word that's not too challenging and you just rest, you close your eyes and you rest in the chair for 20 minutes and you just, just rest um, and kind of say that word to yourself so that um, your mind has somewhere to go other than obsessive thinking. That said, you're going to obsessively think I do. Sometimes I just get up and forget I'm meditating yeah. and it's okay. You just, you just, you just do the next level for you, you know? So if, if you're going from a state of complete franticness and you're able to just sit there and think, Hey, that's progress. It's going to be, it's going to be good. And you do that twice a day and it's actually a great deal of progress and it's continued progress and continued lessening of hamster craziness, mm -hmm. continued growth of just kind of real awareness of like what you really want to be doing and thinking about with your time to actually like own your consciousness and, and to use it for good if you mm -hmm. choose. Um, sure. Or to go make more so, some more mistakes if you want. And, if, and then if that bothers you, you can go back to the paper and say, I'm resentful of myself because I fear I slept around or whatever, you know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, and you just keep taking it, taking it back and taking it through and things just settle down so much faster than you'd ever think. And it's so simple that you think, how could that actually work? Mm -hmm. But so it does I, because it, it gets you out of that, um, the hijack state. Yeah, you know, and then uh, um, because uh, we've talked about this on the show with other, uh, you know, with like neuroscientists and stuff, you know, talking about the different parts of the brain and there are different functions in there. And I, and I have no problem with revisiting that over and over again so that people start to see that, you know, our initial emotional reactions and responses are a part of a brain that are designed to kick you into a survival mode for reasons. You know, if you've got a, something strong happening, um, usually on the scary side of it, it's, it's in, you know, inciting you to run or, you know, hide or, you know, do any number of things. Um, but you don't, you don't make decisions from there. You react, you know, instantly and um, subconsciously from there. So what you're talking about is being able to, you know, calm all that down first, kind of have it, and then allow yourself to transition back up to your front, you know, where you're thinking. Yes. Are. Yeah, yes. Sure. Yes. I'll, I'll describe the brain thing that speaks to me that really set me free. I mean, I felt absolutely liberated. If you do an MRI of somebody who had a high stress childhood, I did when they think about something stressful, left front cortex goes rather quiet, and that's where the reasoning would be happening. Right front cortex gets very loud, and that's where emotions are happening. So less thinking, more feeling. I'm like, yeah, that's what I get. And I, the things I say when I'm in that state are just, just ridiculous and not mm -hmm. fair to people and cause right. harm to relationships. So yeah. it's great if you can start to notice it's happening you can step back from the situation. I, I just whip out, I carry paper and pen everywhere I go because I can bring down that brain intensity of the feelings, you know, just releasing it to paper, just plugging in right there. And then reasoning comes back online and I can just think, oh, probably not a good idea to <laughs> walk out on the job or whatever it is that I'm having the impulse to do. Yeah. I tell your boss to screw off or whatever. Well, you yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we've done these things, right? Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> And then, the, and then, then the remorse. An hour later, your brain comes back online, and you're like, "What have I done?" You know, right, right, yeah. And and I know that that's definitely um, one of those challenges of re of recognizing, um, you know, the fact that we do we engage quickly, you know, and that it really is about you know taking a break, you know, finding a way to be able to you know just. Uh, it, but a difference, you know, and I always say this, and so everybody's like, oh, we're not talking about devaluing your emotion of the moment and saying, you can't be mad or you're not allowed to feel that way. I mean, what you're describing there is we're going to honor that resentment. We're going to honor that fear, that anger, that anxiety, whatever it is, by giving it a space 
but you're not going to dedicate a lot of energy to it because you can't solve whatever's coming from it until you're able to kind of objectify it over here, get yourself to a calmer, more relaxed state, and then go in. And, and I do this with my kids. Like we don't write things down, but it's kind of like when I can see things escalating, you know, um, again, I'm triggered because of all the, you know, kind of chaos and stuff. Um, but it's like time out. Okay. Everybody go, go be pissed off, go be whatever. And then let's come back once we've been able to kind of like bring ourselves back down, you know, to a place where we don't say something that we regret. We're able to, um, you know, explore what was causing the problem, not reacting in defensiveness and, and anger yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, what you've described is a great example of, uh, you know, when, when normal people look at from the outside on this, we end up with this kind of like belief system that like all feelings must be felt and all feelings are good. But the thing is, that's only true for people who don't have a tendency for a bad dream to kick in in the middle of reality. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we're kind of like having distorted thinking about what's going on, uh, it, I, I mean, everybody that's a lot of, if you're in a safe situation, you can express your feelings and somebody can help you sort out. But the reason I have a daily practice is because this stuff has to be sorted out. Some of it is stuff that really is like a feeling and, and, and feelings are there to actually guide us, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're there to steer us away from what's not good. But when that's getting distorted by PTSD, we're getting bad information. And, and so feeling our feelings isn't always in all cases of all feelings, the way out. It can mm -hmm. be like, that can drag you down. And so... So God bless all the people who have been trying to help us all these years by saying, come on, feel the feelings, pound a pillow, you know, and, and it's like actually just pushed us to the brink of suicide. Like we're a little bit different. There's a wiring difference there. And so that's why it's so beautiful to be with people who relate and, and just to start to understand that first there's a little sorting process there. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's a bad dream. Some of it, you know, after you've written all this stuff, you throw it away. It's just like, you don't even have to worry. You just trust that what will come to you in that quiet rest is a little something clearer and more purposeful to do or more, more based on what's really happening or it becomes possible. Like you have an argument with somebody and you know, you get into an argument with somebody when you're, when you're all dysregulated and there's basically nothing they can say. Right. Like, but you, but it's, you know, it's life and death, you know, it's so yeah. bad. There's nothing they can say. And so once, you know, you have a, a, a place for this to go, you're left with, okay, the thing that I was really trying to ask for here was, could you listen to me about that? <laughs> but a lot of it, I just did a post about this this week. A lot of what I learned, um, it was kind of tough love stuff. Like, you know, if, if I sit there and try to take my anger out on people all the time and follow this model that might work for people who don't have PTSD, where you express every bit of anger, I'm basically going to push people away there. Yeah. So I have to find a workaround. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, so, yeah. so cool. yeah, it's, it's a whole new, it, it's kind of, I don't know, sometimes I, it's analogous maybe to being gay. I, I don't mean that gay, being gay is like a, a brain damage thing, but just that like you have this thing that you're trying to fit in with all the time with everybody and what works for them, you just kind of keep noticing it's not working for you. And then one day you finally go, oh, I'm gay, you know, <laughs> or oh, I, I have this. And that explains so much. And then it's like, you're freed up. And all of a sudden you get, you get to look back on all the stuff that's ever been hard for you. And you go, oh, that was because of PTSD. That's just me. That's me. I just screwed up. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's like a whole different thing, but it's something like we didn't ask to be this way. It's not our fault. Mm -hmm. but the fact of the matter is like nobody, nobody can do that. Like reckoning with it except us. we got to like, we got to face what it's doing and see what is possible to heal from here. Right. Yeah. The work is on us to be able to do it as unfair as it feels. And I know one of my resentment statements is, is, and I've said this very openly is like, when you start to uncover the fact that, you know, there were some failures in parent in parenting um, and life experiences were crappy and you end up with the, the results of that. You know, I, I talk about, we get judged you know, it's, it's a tragedy. We live twice. We live it as a child when all the bad stuff is happening. And then we live it again as an adult when we're judged by the results of all of that. And we're condemned for the, you know, the emotional regulations, the responses, the bad choices, the bad decisions, the bad, whatever. And we look at this adult and go, we well, are just an idiot. You're stupid. And, and then you live, you know, you keep living that over and over again, but it is this, um, at the end of the day, it's like, you can't, you can't just point fingers and say, well, you know, 
all that happened and therefore I am. It's like, no, actually you can change that and we should if you want to. If you have a genuine interest in being like for me, genuine interest in not messing my kids up and also not continuing to sabotage myself because I feel like God willing, there's another 40 years left in this body here and I don't want to keep having the same miserable experiences over and over again. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm a big believer. There is no Island of good people and Island of bad people. You know, it's not, everybody isn't like neatly segregated into these categories and it's really easy sometimes when you're kind of early in the process of healing to just be like, Oh, my parents, they were the bad people. And I'm just this good person. And over as you, when you get old enough, you start going, I'm kind of bad too. And Mm -hmm. I got to, and when I think that, and especially when you have kids, you're just like, gosh, I know this very sweet bunch of nursery rhymes. My mother must've taught this to me out of love. (laughs) And maybe I'm, you know, not counting all the things that she was and did, you know, that she was an alcoholic. She didn't ask to be an alcoholic either. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nobody, that's nobody's ambition is to no, have no. that happiness. She in was it. absolutely, she was absolutely doing the best she could. And she did a lot of stuff really well, but the al- alcoholism is notoriously destructive for everybody. Yeah. And, and she never beat it, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a, that's a common theme The people that listen regularly to the show know that, that this is like a no judgment zone. I, we, you know, because, but not passing judgment on what happened to our parents, understanding and respecting, you know, again, the, the, the experiences they had and likely they got it from that generation and the generation before and, and on and on um, doesn't change the fact you have to put the work in. Like you said, yeah. we are still accountable to make the changes internally. They can't be done external to us. No one can tell us what to do or how to do it. We can be guided. And so now I want to talk about what you do to help guide people as they're going through right. this recovery process with uh, their childhood PTSD. So it ta- let's talk about the courses and stuff that you have on your website yeah. that let like, again, literally change the life of one of my listeners here. So, so <laughs> take it. <laughs> well, yeah. So uh, I've had a course out for about a year now called healing childhood PTSD and it's about three hours of video content it covers first of all what's the science of of adverse childhood experience and what we know about the neurological effects this was to me this was groundbreaking and it's uh, I only got this information about five years ago I've been chipping away at this for a long time but that neurological piece was key Mm -hmm. so I teach about the neurology of, of childhood PTSD the whole middle section is a lot about dysregulation. The, you know, what is that? And what are the emotions that trigger dysregulation? Helping people reflect on what do you do when you're dysregulated? What are some of the crappy behaviors you do? Mm-hmm. And, you know, run away from people, cling to them desperately, try to control them. You know, we all have shit we do. And, uh, and it comes from dysregulation. There's, you know, there's, that's why this is so elusive. There'll be situations where you act completely reasonably in some things and then you're triggered and, this, this like other aspect comes out. So I help people reflect on, you know, how are you being affected by this? And then the third section, because, you know, the whole point isn't just to be regulated. The point is to be regulated because then you can pursue any means to be happy and healthy that you choose. You could, you could even try talk therapy. Now I'm not somebody who, who could have done that. I would just get so dysregulated. It would be harmful. But when I'm regulated, I can try all kinds of things. And I can also apply, uh, like I started a company uh, and now I have two companies and I'm married now and things like that type of responsibility of being in a relationship for now like 11 years. And uh, the kids, you know, having kids has, was absolutely the most wonderful heart opening thing in my life. And it really helped my development quite a bit. And I just got to say like, that has not been so much a trigger for me. Just the incredible responsibility of being a single mom could be very triggering sometimes. That's just like, I cannot do one more thing and I'm going to yell at the kids. <laughs> uh, and, and then the desperate grabbing on to men, hoping to like fix that single mom situation, you know. But I, I teach people, people basically the path that I followed out of that pit that I was in. When I found myself, I had, you know, a single mom. It was 2000, it was in the mid 2000s. I was a consultant and there were no jobs in consulting anymore because the economy collapsed. And I was standing over a dead body for the second time in my romantic life and it was Mm -hmm. pretty bad. And and so that's when I just got very serious about, I I was going to change no matter what it took. And I became very humble about what was wrong and really saw how much my decisions were destructive. So this is all to say, 
that what I've experienced is first you deal with the brain, then you start taking on the self-defeating behaviors. And occasionally people kind of push back on me and they say, aren't you blaming the victim? And I, it's like, I'm not blaming anybody, you know, but the fact is when we grew up with this hard stuff, we end up with hard stuff. And mm -hmm. at this point, like my parents have been dead for more than 25 years. That's not who's doing it to me now. It's kind of more like the, the, the fruit of things that I've done and the, the choices that I made when I was dysregulated and unconscious, the things I said that were destructive when I wasn't really quite present. So it's, it's about really facing like, what have I got? So I have a lot of, um, so my course takes that on about like, how do you pick your, your top level thing? And for most people, there's going to be a top level thing and it's going to probably be substances, relationships, or avoidance. Those are kind of the big three. And you pick the top one and start working on it. So then I put out a course that's all about dating and relationships for people with childhood PTSD. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's how I finally had a, a, a courtship with a great guy and it led to marriage and something really new happened for me. And I distilled what mentors helped me with through that process. We have, many of us have a tendency to get very unconscious in mate selection. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and when we're feeling like, we're, we're kind of weird and we're not put together right and we don't have the memo. There's a certain comfort level with other people who are screwed up too. Mm -hmm. And two, two screwed up people can be bad. And um, so to get together with somebody to, to like work on my own recovery and then to meet somebody who's pretty in pretty good shape themselves. That was like, I mean, that was rocket science to me. I had no idea how to do it. It just wouldn't happen. I wasn't attracted to those people. Right. And so I got help to do a very slow kind of courtship. So, there's some of the favorite videos I've made ever in my life are in that course. And it's about the, the patterns of like um, magical thinking to rationalize being with a bad person, um, not having very good standards for ourselves and being like, I, I coach a lot of people on relationships. And one of the really common problems for people with PTSD is I say, well, what do you really want? And they go, Oh, I want like, you know, they, they can't really even say the words of what they want. Like somehow like having like a marriage or a, um, to truly be loved, like that seems like too much to ask for. Mm -hmm. Like there's something about PTSD that like beats you down and then you just think you have this vague idea, somebody that we would hang out all the time and they're pretty cool. And, <laughs> and yeah. then you get what you asked for, right? And, <laughs> <laughs> yep. and I wanted to get married. And so I started to date like that's what I wanted, which meant yeah. it was right, that, right out on the table. And, um, and I didn't go out with anybody who wasn't interested in marriage and who didn't meet certain criteria that I now had. Mm -hmm. of what was going to be a suitable husband and step parent to my boys. And so, so I teach all about that. I have um, a free course, as I mentioned on the daily practice, that's just, it was shown to me for free forever. I teach the world for free. I also do free webinars every week where we can do that together. And um, I have a new course coming out um, this summer, which is all about dysregulation. It's a daily boot camp with a video a day that to just really drill down on the dysregulation and start working on the triggers and, um, it's kind of, you know, I just find like the boot camp format's really helpful to focus on stuff that you know ought to be a daily habit, but it's hard mm -hmm. to fit into your daily thing. So, so that's, I'm working on that right now, shooting that on the 10th. And, um, and then I'm soon going to be working on, um, uh, courses on, um, working careers. Like, I don't know about you, but you know, the PTSD really, really undermines your career. And, yep. and, and here's, here's the thing. So many of us are the most brilliant, wonderful people with gifts to bring. We're so smart. We've had our intelligence suppressed and our ability to focus suppressed. And when you can heal that, there's like this unleashing of, of a like pent up brilliance that starts coming out. I keep seeing it after one person after another, men and women, where this brilliance, it's like happens much faster than mm -hmm. it would have otherwise happened if you were just going along a normal trajectory. Mm -hmm. And it is so exciting to be connected to people who are on that journey and what they really had inside and that they're able to like make a plan, follow through on it, mm -hmm. <laughs> interact with the people who can help them do it. It's so exciting. So I really want to help people with their work and their vocation. I just keep thinking like, doesn't it seem like about 15% of the goodness in the world is missing? Well, maybe that's, maybe that's all, the, all the gifts of the people who have too much trauma to let it out right now. And so it seems to me like I just, I'm just giving my whole life to this. I want to help people 
recover enough that they bring their gifts to bear. It only makes everything better for everyone. Yeah, I agree. hundred percent, hundred percent. So, um, and you know, to your point, absolutely. It's one of the things that people know that follow me and know the show that that was another one of my, my trifectas, the parenting, the bad relationships and the careers. I've started a handful of amazing companies and then they stalled out because the personal relationships fell apart or, you know, something happened with myself, uh, you know, with myself a hundred percent. And I just, that was a part, it was like, I'm done with this. I'm too smart yeah. to keep failing at great businesses that, Oh, don't quite get there. And yeah. So, um, so those are, I mean, and dating, I don't even want to get into that right now, but yeah, I, I'm with you. you know, I'm with you on that one. And I actually feel like I can define what I want, you know, pretty well, but I'm like, you, it's like when I couldn't put a finger on it, it's like, well, I don't need to, I don't need to date anybody. Like I need to figure that out. And so I'm, I'm, I am, I'm clear. It's like, you know, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I want. And if you are adding to it, great. But if you don't, it's so easy to say no. <laughs> like before when you um, are desperate for the relationship or desperate for the attention and that positive reinforcement, because you're filling in a hole that, you know, you're actually digging out the bottom of it and continuing it on. Um, you, you say yes to a lot of things and you go out with a lot of people and, and it never fills you up. And then once you're able to like stop shoveling and, um, and do it, you're like, wow, my, my standards change. And it's not that, you know, people are terrible, but it's just like, I just, it's easier for me to be peaceful. And I, you know, I tell them just being at peace and being patient and, um, and being very like targeted. Like I know my life will be, you know, in a, a you know, what I'm doing, I want somebody, I call it the icing on the cake. I have a beautiful cake I'm baking. I want, and I want a person with their cake. I want us to co-create the icing together that tastes good on both of it, but we get to yeah. each be ourselves and we get to have these things that add to us, you know? Yeah. So, and that takes time, you know, and I learned not to rush that anymore. So I'm, I'm chase really, after yeah. it like a feral raccoon. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. yeah, yeah. Anybody listening to that, you don't chase them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You let them prove, you let them show you what they've got to offer. You let them show you and demonstrate. You yeah. kind of want to know. It turns out that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you show up authentically yourself too. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, it's a two way, it's a two way thing. So awesome. Yeah. Well, Anna, Lydia was right. She's going to be very excited. <laughs> You're awesome. And like I said, I feel um, that there's definitely this, uh, this kindredness in terms of like, I've got this thing. I figured something out. I need to help other people and inspire to do that. So it's a pleasure knowing you now and, um, and seeing what you're doing. And so for anybody that's actually looking for the self-examination, um, you do have, you know, some ways of being able to determine, like we talked about here, but you can go to her website and the link is going to be in the podcast notes um, so that you can actually explore this area um, for yourself about uh, PTSD. Um, and then the courses are available online. And so um, when you go to her website, you'll be able to click there. She does have a fantastic blog. The articles are amazing. And so you can subscribe to, to her things. Are there other ways that people can actually find you? Facebook, YouTube? Um, yeah, Facebook, YouTube. YouTube seems to be where the most uh, interesting action is a very exciting community they're very kind community mm -hmm. not so much the other social <laughs> aren't you fed up with that gosh but yeah. the, the youtube community is great and um so yeah I'm, I'm always challenged to try to bring it together into one hub where people can yeah cool well congratulations on the work that you're doing now and congratulations on the work on yourself so um, you. yeah. Same to you. Thank Same you. To you. Really thank nice you. to meet you. Yep. Cool. So it's been a pleasure. I appreciate you so much and thank you for being on today. Thank you. Thank you.